to How I Got Here, the inside stories of startups and innovation in travel and transportation with your hosts, FocusWire's Kevin May and Mozio's David Litwack. Hello, and welcome to How I Got Here, Mozio and FocusWire's weekly podcast delving into the innovators in travel and transportation. This week, we're joined by Alex Zozaya. Alex is the chairman of Apple Leisure Group, a conglomerate of 14 leading travel and hospitality brands, including Apple Vacations, United Vacations, CheapCaribbean.com, Amstar DMC, Tricep Solutions, and the Mark Travel Corporation. Alex started his career as the founder of AM Resorts, one of the group's largest brands, and Apple Leisure Group serves over 3.2 million guests annually, uh, pre-coronavirus times, of course. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Alex. Thank you so much for having me, Dave. So we like to start out all these interviews the same way, which is for us to ask you how you got here. Yeah, well, I got here by following my passions. I mean, I was I, I started by doing dishes and cooking in, in kitchens and restaurants in London back in the 1986. And then I started in a large hotel company, started also for food and beverage, which is which is my passion. And then grew up in that company to the point that I was VP of sales and marketing for the whole company, a very large company, hotel company, um, public in Mexico, Fiesta Americana and Posadas. And then I decided that, that there was a specific niche that gave me an opportunity to start this new concept in the, in the hospitality industry. And that's how I started AIM Resorts back in 2001. It's going to be 20 years on August this year. And uh, so I left, I left that other company to start this, this company. And my goal was to have 10 hotels in 10 years. And I was wrong. By 10 years, we had close to 40. And now we're close to 100. So uh, it's been a very fun journey. Amazing. Uh, so over this time, you guys have become a group, uh, not just AM Resorts. You guys have uh, um, emerged or uh, become a conglomerate with a very legendary vacation packaged a company called Apple uh, Vacations. You have also uh, bought some hardcore technology on the packaging side. So maybe you can tell us how, what was the evolution from uh, AM Resorts to becoming the, the you know, uh, massive conglomerate you guys are today? Yeah, the first company was Apple Vacations. That's 51 years old and it's a tour operator based in, uh, in the United States. And, uh, and who was the number one customer of many destinations in Mexico and the Caribbean. And I noticed that they were putting so many customers in certain hotels that there was no reason why they couldn't have their own hotels and start driving that distribution to specific products. Those products would be customized to that customer and it could be a winning formula. And that's when I met with John Mullen, which was the founder of Apple Vacations back in the day. And we decided to start our own company, a hotel company. I was working in an independent company, but at the same time, have the, the additional benefit of have their own distribution that we could concentrate volumes of customers into these hotels that for the first time they were tailored to that specific customer. And that thing, that was it. That was innovation. We can go into detail later on. But then at that point, it was, it was Apple Vacations and AIM Resorts and Amstar. Amstar is a destination management company what's taking care of the passengers on destination, not just transfers, but excursions and things like that. And then we had an airline, which thank God we don't have anymore. Back in the day, it was called USA 3000. But they were independent companies. The only thing we had in common was a strategic plan that we have on that. On, on working together, but there wasn't a company. And then years later, uh, we decided for a different reason, we decided to sell the majority stake of the company to a private equity fund. And that's when they created the umbrella. They created the holding company, Apple Issue Group. I became the CEO of that umbrella and that new vehicle that was already fully integrated went out and bought different companies since 2013 till today. We've been buying companies since then. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Alex. It's uh, Kevin here. Um, did you, when you, when you looked at the way the, the, the organization came together, so you've got like a, a tour operator and a hotel rep company, and, uh, and you referenced there was an airline as well. I mean, where I sit here in Europe, that's very similar to you know, quite a, a number of kind of large tour operating brands that, that we have or, you know, dare I say, used to have here in Europe in the, you know, in the kind of the Thomas Cook and the tours of this world. I mean, 
North American based, were you learning anything from the way those companies were kind of created in the 80s to bring all these, we call them vertically integrated tour operators here in the, yeah. in the UK? Is that a model that you looked at and learned from or a model that you looked at and thought, let's not do it that way, let's do it our own way? No, no, no. I looked, I knew these companies very well. I actually worked for those companies in my previous life in the other hotel company, those large yeah. vertical tour operators. But I learned a lot what not to do. Right. From- <laughs> so we do it differently because the U.S. market is completely different and the distribution in the U.S. is very different. At least back in the day, prior to the OTAs and, uh, you know, all the online business that we have today, the distribution was significantly different than in the than than in Europe. So so we took that into consideration in order to create a model that was different, mainly catered for the US customer. So unlike the tours for the Thomas Cooks or other Italian uh, companies back in the day, Mentalio and Alpitour and some Spanish companies like Soltour, Sambaya Principe, etc. We were not certainly the first ones who created the integration between the distribution through a tour operator to a hotel company, but we wanted the hotel company to be completely independent, to stand on its own feet. So we started working, and that was the major difference, our hotel company started working directly with our distribution company, right. with a distribution company. So we work with everybody. It's like uh, the Tui Hotels working with Thomas Cook or Thomas Cook Hotels working with Tui actively to the point that our own distribution company represented only 20% of the occupancy in our own hotels. So distribution was a great like a safety net that we would always have a chance to have good customers and most importantly more knowledge of the customer. That's how we utilize the distribution, the, the understanding of the customer. But we did not depend, the success of the hotels did not depend on a distribution company. We came from the get-go as a very independent, working with every single uh, distribution companies, including the red competitors of our own distribution company. And, uh, and that's why it's not called Apple Hotels. Yeah. So went to a different name, different route. And I think that was very different than the business models, integrated business models you see or you used to see in Europe. I, I'm always interested in when two organizations come together to form a group. Um, but in your, in, in your case, uh, AM Resorts was fairly new and Apple Vacations, as we said before, goes back to 1969, 68, yeah. 69, something like that. Yeah. So inevitably you're going to have two businesses with fundamentally different types of cultures and leadership teams. And how, how did you kind of work through that as the as the kind of you the yourself the leader of the new group in kind of bringing those cultures together or did you think actually because they've got separate cultures let them operate individually that's a very good question it took me about 10 years okay. <laughs> to, to, to integrate the culture that was the most important challenge because a resource was done from the get-go from the ground up so it was born with every every employee had a skin in the game so every employee of Apple, a resource, we were, we were only six in the company. We're 34,000 now, but it was only six back then. All those six and then all those 20, all those 50, and all those 100 employees had a skin in the game. Uh, so they have incentive plans and bonuses totally aligned with the benefit, the overall benefit of the company. Unlike Apple Vacations, which is a way more traditional company where we pay you a good salary, you're a good employee, and you do your job. Right. So uh, we started by disclosing in AIM Resource all the information from, from, from day one to all of the employees. So they totally understood the contribution to the company from the get one and they feel a lot more engaged versus the culture of secrecy of a family business who never disclosed the results. Did you just right. do your, and you know, we, we'll let you know how good you did. So that took a long time, but also when, when the, 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 the companies were not the exact same shareholders behind, but a very similar shareholders in between the two. And we were working at the beginning in separate buildings and we came under one big building. And I think there was a lot of resistance on the Apple vacation side to feel that they had to send the customers to the AIM Resort hotels. So the decisions was not into the hand of Apple vacations anymore, almost like by mandate, they had to do it. And there's always a resistance to do that. So we had to work on how do we align the, 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 the compensations and the motivations, the bonuses and incentives to make sure that the success of the hotel company was also the success of the tour operation and that translated into the success on the individuals themselves. That took 
long, way more than it should be. But, uh, but, but, but I think it, it ended up working great. And one of the reasons is because we were moving much faster than our competitors. And, and, and last one for me for a moment. I mean, um, you said that was the most difficult thing. What would you say, you know, often people talk about culture and stuff. But what was the second most difficult thing about bringing two, the, you know, two organizations and more together over that period? Was it more yeah. to do with distribution and things like that? Yeah, well, I, 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 there were several challenges. One, it became very expensive. The, uh, the, you know, the, the hotel business is a very capital intense business. The tour operation, it's large in cash flow uh, and revenues, but small in margins and very light on capital uh, yeah. and capital expenses or capital investments. And, uh, and we, so we started, it was kind of like, we never lease a hotel, but we were managing hotels for third parties with the guarantee. And then we reached the point, that, especially after 9-11, that a lot of opportunities came in the market. And one of the challenges was, was how can we grab these opportunities without needing to buy the assets? Because that would require a lot of money and was still a family business. So um, getting the people on board, having them trusting us, we needed to gain the trust of many key players. One was a trust of the hotel owners that believed that with us, their hotels would perform better than without us. So selling them a business model that it wasn't proven with brands that were unknown. So that's, <laughs> there were unknown brands, uh, Mr. No one in the hotel business, and they had to trust us. And if it wasn't because of the crisis, they didn't need to trust us. The right. crisis, the great opportunity. It was because they needed to trust someone. They trust us and they gave us the opportunity. So gain the trust. But we also had to gain the trust of all of the non-Apple vacation players in the industry distribution that we will not cheat on them. In other words, we will not undercut the rates. I will not be working with American Airlines or Gogo or TUI and giving a better deal to Apple vacations because it was part of the group. So how can we make the customers trust? You should sell my hotels because they are great product at a great price and you're going to make money with it without you advertising my product and me on the cutting with one of your competitors on the table. So we need to gain both trust. That was huge, uh, but it worked again because of the crisis. I think that's a perfect segue into actually, I was just thinking, well, we're obviously in a crisis right now, right? And you know, I, I think that we do try to keep these away from some COVID and coronavirus, you know, discussions, but I think um, it begs the question, I think this will be evergreen even after this, is that um, how would you think about taking advantage of crises? And I, I think that's an, in some ways an awful way to phrase it, actually, so let me restate that. Like, how do you, how do you adapt during a uh, something like this is so decimating to the industry. There are clearly going to be opportunities. And how? Do, what is your decision matrix almost like when you look at something like 9/11? I hate to say it, or this, where it could be decimating to some companies, but others, if you're on, if you can get off your, be on your back feet, you can actually um, advance your company. Yeah. Well, again, every crisis brings an opportunity, and this is a cliche, but for us, it's been absolutely the story of our life. I, I think the, the fastest growth for us was first during 9/11. Then during the crisis of, of 08 and 09, uh, the, the, and the financial crisis, but all, particularly in the real estate space, but also the uh, H1N1 super strong virus that we had, particularly for Mexico, but also for the United States and the region that we had also back in 2009. So if you see a growing path, you will see how the biggest spikes on growth will happen precisely right after each crisis. That's when we are being grabbing the opportunities. And the reason why is because our business model is designed to navigate better in times of crisis. We, that I always said that because we're high-end type of product, we go to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the high end of the mass market. That's where our niche is. And uh, I, I, I always use the analogy of we are like the Range Rover. So it's a luxury vehicle, but performs very well when the weather conditions are bad or when the road conditions are bad. So when the conditions on the road are great, you know, when the, when the, when the road is flat, when it's sunny, when the, when the pavement is totally even, uh, when, when all of the conditions are perfect, you won't really notice the difference in between a Range Rover and a Subaru or a, or a Hyundai. You won't really notice the difference. Uh, but everybody performs well. But when the crisis comes, that's when you need that extra flexibility and that possibility to get off the road, 
riding the right, uh, riding the storm, go through the through difficult conditions, and still come out success, uh, uh, successfully. And that's why our business model is way more resilient during the type of crisis. That's when you really see the difference on how we how we perform. And and who is the one who sees the difference? Certainly, hotel owners. They see how our hotels perform much better than the competition. When everybody's doing well, we're on the top top of the top of the wave, and they notice but it's not very relevant. But when everybody goes down and we're still running high, that's when the, big, the difference stands out. So hotel owners notice, also banks. We have many opportunities when the bank tells the hotel owner, you know, there's a crisis, you're struggling. Why don't you call in resource because they're doing something because the hotels that we have with them or with the owners that hotels managed by them are performing much better than the competition. So they must be using some additional weapons, additional tools that you don't. So a lot of the referrals are coming precisely from the from the banks. So I think opportunities we've been able to capture them precisely because by design we were born during a crisis. Well, so can I can I ask a follow up question there? What do you think that is exactly? Is it the vertical integration that makes you more aligned uh, in, in a way? Because the, the the term that came up came to me was. Um, uh, uh, anti-fragile, which is, you know, a term from Nick, uh, Nassim Taleb, who, you know, is a, a guru and among many of the listeners to the podcast and anyone who's in startups. Um, and the idea is like, you know, uh, a system that gains from disorder. Um, and, and I think uh, if maybe you don't gain from disorder, you just lose a hell of a lot less than everyone else like in a, in a time. But um, I'm curious, you know, if you can walk us through how you've built that so that you at least are le- losing less from disorder. Yeah, well, certainly, certainly is the, uh, the distribution within our distribution companies like Apple Vacations, Travel Impressions, Southwest Vacations, all these companies that you named at the beginning. So that certainly helps. That, that when the crisis go down, when there's a hurricane in an island, when there is a pandemic, when we just open a hotel, the ramp up period for a hotel, our ramp up period is much faster. Ramp up by referring to the stabilization time in a hotel. Another company will say it's three years. We do it in about one year because we concentrate our, 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 our distribution way more precisely when there's a crisis or when there's a need for that. So, so yes, our distribution companies are a big part of it. But also we have a very strong vacation club. So we have 120,000 members that they represent already about 12 to 15 percent are occupants of our, our occupancy in the hotels and they're the most loyal customers and they also come as an additional distribution but it's also on the product side on the product side it's not just distribution on the product side i think we developed these experiences that would compete with cruise ships in a much more efficient way that would compete with theme parks okay when you make a decision to go in a theme park so the overall experience that we were providing, that we do provide right now, will be a, a, a more likely choice for someone that has restricted time or money because it's a lot more value for the money. Not because it's cheaper, but it's a lot more value for the money. And I think that perception, the way we've been able to compete with good products, and by the way, good marketing behind, I think it's been very, very successful, especially resilient during the time of crisis. We kind of act in a counter product cycle. When everybody, when everybody is, 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 is suffering and everybody is selling, that's when we buy and vice versa. And when we buy, I'm, I'm talking about, that's when we take risks. So just to, I think to translate something you said there, uh, I think I understood it. Um, it's almost like you mentioned at the very beginning that 20%, only, only 20% of your uh, inventory comes from your own channels sometimes, and it's the other yeah. percent is from Tui and Tom, you know, formerly Thomas Cook, RIP, um, and stuff like that. And the idea is that when a crisis hits, though, you can it easily be- go and say, I, we're going to prefer all of our traffic to our, our, our properties. And basically, now is the time to take, well, we're at, we're at 80% down because of COVID, but all that 20% that's left is going to our resorts to, to support those resorts. And sorry to everyone else. <laughs> like, but is, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. I, I, just to change pace a little bit, I mean, I'm counting here um, the number of subsidiaries that you've got, and it's was it 15, 14, 15, something like that. How do you, when you were the CEO and now as the as the chairman, how do you kind of? I'm always curious. How do you divide your time up between 
or how did you divide your time up between concentrating on, say, United Vacations one week or Funway Holidays another week? Or, you know, is it based on what you know about the people that are the leadership teams of those individual brands? You think, oh, I, you know, I can probably leave them alone for a couple of months because I know they're in safe hands and this one needs a little bit of TLC. How do you go about as, as, as the leader of the whole group dividing your time? Well, I, I, I put my time and my energy where I can add most value for the company. And, and I'm glad to say that where I can add most value happens to be the areas that I love the most. So, so when the, we do have a very strong team, uh, particularly on the distribution side, the travel agent side, that, that area is very, is very strong. Certainly, they all know more about their business than I do know. So right. my time more about how do we make those companies interact and capture the synergies among all of them. Uh, as well as with the technology company that we that we, that we bought, but certainly leaving all that day-to-day job to the experts, which is part of which is part of our team. I have never stayed focusing on growth and development, particularly in time of crisis. Where are the opportunities? What can we grab? Which additional hotel we can get? Is there an opportunity to launch a new brand? How can we work? So I've been dedicating a lot of my time into products and relationships. I had to have the relationship with, a go- with governments. Every time there's a crisis right now, I'm loving, not just as part of the WTTC, but also part of our own company, I'm loving with governments to, you know, to, to pursue them on protocols and testing and, and quarantine and all that type of things. So, so I spend my time really bringing the company on the, on the, on the uh, uh, like uh, representing the company at a high level with the areas that would be more relevant and a big picture. Again, governments, investors, uh, media, uh, uh, but very focused on what I do know how to do well, which is the product, the marketing, and the investment side of the business. And then uh, uh, the day-to-day running the operations, certainly we have experts doing that for us. And of course, during the time of crisis, we get together more often and we have an agenda. We have a crisis committee and we have, a, we have an agenda where we make sure that the plan is being executed uh, uh, correctly. But I never lose focus or never uh, divert my attention from the areas where I think they're core, uh, uh, which is, again, the product and the, the, the customer relation. And, and, and also to see what are the competition, or not just the competition, even thinking out of the box by using what all best practices from other industries are doing and try to incorporate best practices to, 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 to our company. I've got a couple of kind of follow-up questions if I can, Alex. The first one is, you know, if you're a startup entrepreneur, you've learned how to bring teams together and raise money and, you know, th- those kind of things. In your case, you know, you've bought various companies together and then you've led them to go from that to lobbying with governments is is that a different kind of leadership mindset or is it something that you kind of slip into naturally i'm I'm curious you know everybody has different skills but i think one of the skills that i have and a lot of a lot of people that is doing well has is common sense and uh and the other one is passion I think that, uh, yeah, no, it's a completely se- different set of skills to see that and negotiate with the government that, 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 that the, uh, the value or, or the priorities of the government is one, very different than, the, than the, the priorities of an investor. You have to focus on profitability in one hand, the other one you have to focus on a, in a, in a political gain or a, or, a, or a benefit for the community, et cetera. Those are different skills than the ones about executing a merge or executing the synergies of two companies. They're, they're different skills and, and, and I don't have them, all of them. What I do have is common sense and, 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 and a little passion. And, and that passion I have to say uh, is contagious. And I think I being able, I think one of the biggest, if, if not the, the, the most important skill that I have is being able to bring that passion to the team to the point that I've been able to track the best team, keep them enrolled and keep them, keep them fully engaged, and then they're able to go and execute on their own. I'm not on top of the daily things on, on, on any of them, especially now, but even when I had a more active role as a CEO, 
uh, I never been like on top of the of the of the people in different areas. I think all of the initiatives in the technology side are completely different than what we're doing now in open up, you know, Cuba. That I was dealing with the Cubans and and you know yeah. have mojitos and see how can we gonna enter the West market into into Cuba and and negotiating in Washington. You know, it's like it's a completely different set of skills. But I can tell you the common denominator is common sense and passion. And I think that's what I've been able to bring at every area in the company. I, I certainly think some would uh, argue for a lot more common sense to be added into many governments around the world at the moment, certainly where I am here in the UK. But uh, I, I, I digress massively. Back to you, if we can. I mean, you, you talk about bringing common sense and passion. Has, have there been occasions, and you know, feel free to maybe name one of the subsidiaries, where you have had to step in because there have been problems or it's just needed that kind of bigger leadership role to get a particular division over the edge or over the over a particular hurdle that they were facing yeah well many times many times it's starting it's you know misalignment internal misalignment on the decisions when we have the distribution companies very focused on on traffic for example but not in contribution where they know that they would make more money as an independent profit unit on the distribution side that they would make on the hotel side and try to align the agreements. I've been have to step in many times and try to communicate why the overall good for the company, a dollar here is worth more than a dollar here. And why this is more strategic than this one. This is more long-term thinking and this is more short-term thinking. So try to align culture and align objectives and all that within the company. It's been, I have to step up many times in the past. So that, that's one. But also with, with of course, with, with, uh, with investors you see many times with the investors you know some of the hotel owners are very wealthy and 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 the hotels that they have that we manage it's not their it's not the core business but some of them this is all they have so so um and their children grow and now the children wants to manage the hotel themselves and they have a son that graduated from cornell and now they want to be the jam so i, I <laughs> managing the relationship with owners it's something that i really like i'm owner i'm an owner myself my family and i have investments in hotels that are managed by by apple issue group but i have the role as an owner so i understand the owner because i'm also a hotel owner myself and i had to step in many times to make sure that our management team fully understands and puts them put themselves in the position of the owner even for things that sound silly but but i I have a son that is graduating and now wants to drive the car. What are you going to do? My <laughs> wife just finished her career in interior designing and she wants to redecorate the hotel. What are you going to do? So things like that, from that to they're under financial stress. How can we help an owner to refinance without us having to subsidize or lending the money necessarily? And I being interjecting and acting on behalf of the owners with banks or financial institutions many times, or when one owner wants to sell. When there's a crisis like that, it's an opportunity. Yeah. In many cases, that the, the owner wants to sell, I better get myself involved into that project because I want to find a new investor that is aligned with our goals and not having one of our owners selling to one of our competitors. So I, I had to step in in many situations with owners, with governments, many many cases with governments. I'm actively involved with governments, and certainly within internally within our teams. I feel like there's got to be a couple stories there. Those were very specific things about a Cornell graduate and an interior design wife. Uh, I'm going to ask a little follow-up here. Is there is there anything you'd like to share, Alex? A funny story, maybe? No. No, no. But those those stories are true stories. I mean, it's yeah. it, 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 it's an an analogy, but it but it but it's true. Or when you have to open a hotel before the governor or before the prime minister or before the minister of tourism ends of its term because they want to hang the medals, and you have to start start conducting yourself in a in a, you know uh, against what it would be the common sense because you have to act. There's 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 you have to understand what's an it's an alternative motive. That 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 would make no sense, but 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 if you can do it to help, you do it. But uh, uh, in in several situations where you would say um, that makes absolutely no sense, but now I understand why. Uh, and and you have to do some things for political purposes in some destinations for helping a hotel owner. Sometimes a staff driven 
uh, some things that are very important for our staff and, and and our team and uh and we have to introduce them and we have to try to give them a chance of running and support them without necessarily them being part of a of a business plan uh the way we created the brands it's it's an example when with the hotel brands you know when we created dreams and we got secrets and we got some skin, how do we create the dreams brand sometimes it's just uh literally those brands were created in a napkin i i, I designed the logo and uh come up with the names and see how let's test this and they came up as a consequence of something that is unexpected and all of a sudden it's like okay it makes sense let's let's do it let's go let's go with that i think i have to say before we sold the majority stake of our company to a private equity, first paying capital and now KKR and KSL, when it was strictly family business, way more of our important decisions were done 100% based on, on, on intuition, uh, unlike now. Now it's, you know, we have a lot more data-driven decisions. Before it was 100% intuitive. And uh, yeah, it's risky, but many of them, they worked. And, uh, you know, when you hear the story, then you say, oh, that's, that's funny. I would thought it would be something more, way more sophisticated. Like, like the way John Mullen came up with the brand Apple. I think that's a fascinating story. Um, but uh, again, those are things that, that, that now as a more institutional company, we don't, we don't do as much as we used to. Can you, can you actually tell us that story? I don't think it, many people would know. What's, what's the fascinating story by an Apple, the, the name? Yeah. Apple, and I think it's very important because at the end now we are Apple Issue Group and the oldest of the companies that we have from all of the companies we have now is Apple Vacations. But back in the day, John Mullen, uh, the company was, was uh, name was Atkinson and Mullen uh, because they were the two founders, um, John Mullen and, and Alan Atkinson, who was, by the way, a football player who won the Super Bowl for the Jets. Um, so, so they were the founders and that's why it was called Atkinson and Mullen and, and, and they were looking for a name uh, for a company that it was a, it was more catchy, and and he came up with a list of names like uh, uh, international travel tours or or or, or global global tours uh, enterprises or uh, traveling uh, leisure blah 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 all these logical names corporate like everybody was calling back in the day, and and he did a list of about twenty names. But then someone told him that the name had to be a five-letter name and had to be memorable. So choose two. And he chose two. One was Daisy and then one was Apple. And that was way before Apple computers. Back in the day, I don't even think it was Macintosh, but anyway. And then he gave the list to all his employees. Forget about McKinsey and Arthur Anderson back in the day. He just gave it to the employees and said, from all these names, from, from one to ten, put a number next to to the name, which one you like the most and which one you like the least, at least the top 10 the names. So everybody put the name and he looked at the results. Nobody voted for Apple, nobody. The names were like, as I said, international travel, vacations, global vacations, blah, blah, blah. He, he, he took the list and said, okay, the winners is ABC. Apple was not even in the top 10 for anybody. And he said, well, I'm gonna keep this list in the drawer and I wanna ask them again in two weeks. So he kept the list. And two weeks later, he came out and said, you remember the list that I gave you? Oh, yes. You remember the names on that list? Well, and they started making up names that were not in the list, exactly. And they said the one that they all remember was Apple. Is the one nobody liked, but everybody remembered. I remember Apple. I remember Apple. And he said, okay, then I'm going to call it Apple. It's not the one you like the most. It's the one you remember the best. <laughs> that was a decision made not by a marketing guru, not about an external outsource. If I ask that question today, I immediately will have 10 consultants charging me a fortune. It will be a six month investigation and they come up with the same conclusion. So, so I think that, <laughs> that, type of thing, that type of thing came up great. The brand dreams, for example, for the hotels, which is now one of our most important brands. We have secrets, dreams, sunscreen. We have seven brands. But dreams, we created because we had an adults only high end brand called Secrets. And then we had a family uh, uh, fun four-star brand called Sunscape. And all of a sudden, we found a hotel in Los Cabos, which is a high-end destination, that it was perfect to be a Secrets. But because that hotel, before we came in, 
had a lot of timeshare in that the previous management company sold timeshare in. There were a lot of families that they would come back to the hotel in the long term. So we were facing, shall we make a secrets for families as an exception? Secrets was adults only. Secrets for families as an exception. Or shall we make a Sunscape grant, Sunscape Deluxe, which was the four star product that we have. So we said, okay, Sunscape grant. We even, did, we even had a logos. We made the same logo, but in gold to make it look more upscale. So like Sunscape grant, Sunscape Deluxe, Sunscape something high end, or secrets for families, the exception. And one day I just woke up and said, you know, neither one. Let's create a new brand. It's going to look like secrets because it's high end but it's gonna be something new and we're gonna call it Dreams. And it just came like that out of the blue. And in the same day, we launched Secret Cancun, Vallarta and Los Cabos. And it was a big success. And it, was, it would just came out of the blue. So that's the type of stories and situations that you just take the risk, you go for it, follow your instincts and intuition and, and, and you make it happen. I feel like a lot of that probably also was building on years and years and years. I found that as I've gotten farther along in my career certain things like you know naming something new become come, just come easier because it's it's 10 years of being in the travel industry for you to pull some random reference and then and you know and then combine it with some new piece of information that you're able to you know uh, you know kind of summon your creativity a lot better have you felt that you your job in this way has gotten easier as you've approached are you 40 years in into your career in the travel industry at this point I'm 35 now. Okay. Uh, uh, no, yes, it is, it is. It is. I think people, at least my team, trust me more now when I come up with a crazy idea because because we prove prove we we prove many of the ideas. But I also have a lot of pushbacks. There is there is a lot more things you have to take to be careful now. You know, that particularly our our, our our general counsel. You know, so many times we have with an, we come up with an idea sounds great. And then our general counsel said, wait, 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 wait. You haven't seen the legal part of it. I was like, oh my God, that's the worst part because it's uh, talking about expensive uh, solutions and, uh, and, and obstacles in between the benefit of the customer and the corporation. It's all of the regulatory frame in between, especially in the US where the, the, the biggest sport in the US is not football, is suing each other. And, uh, and and that 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 that's that's a that's a major issue. Like like we came during the uh, and that was another big moment for us when during the H one N one we came up with a free flu guarantee, and we was promising that anybody who caught the swine flu in our hotels would have three uh, uh, three years of free vacations in our hotels. We knew that it was a flu, nobody would die from it, or very few people would die from it. They had the tummy flu. We, we, we knew it, we, could, we could put their money with our mouth was to say, we're safe. You're not gonna get any more sick here than you would be outside. And we, if you do get sick, if you do get the swine flu, we we'll give you three years for free. We, we, we launched that like on a Monday. By Saturday, we were in the cover of the New York Times. And then Fox News got it and CNN and I went to TV interviews everywhere. Everybody got it. And then the good news is that the other hotels got it. And then as a destination, we were promoting, we'll give you the guarantee if anybody catches the swine flu during your stay, it's going to be a three-year guarantee. We'll give you that. And immediately the occupants start to recuperate and it worked great. But then, of course, the legal team comes and say, yeah, but what if, what if, what if, what if? Now, with the pandemic, we've been from... If we've been right now the, uh, uh, testing from giving free tests to the to the to the to the guests, and of course we have to test the staff to the vaccine. We were we were thinking now that we have the permit to as private company to to import the vaccine, having a strategic alliance with the hospital, and start giving the vaccination to our staff and maybe even our guests. Now that the United States uh, put the new um, um, uh, restriction, no restriction, but the new measurement that everybody comes back after January 26th to the country is going to have a test. We are going to give free tests to all of our guests in the hotel. They're not going to have to leave the hotel. They're going to get the results before they check out. So they don't have it. All these initiatives that we've been taking that the competition copies immediately, which I think is great because we don't want to use this as a competitive advantage just for our company. We want to make sure that the traffic comes back 
every of these measurements that we took, in particular in a crisis like this, it, we don't want to make it a, a, a competitive advantage for us. We want to make it standard practice for everybody so the consumer understands and then we regain traffic. We worry about the uh, market share later on. But all these initiatives, now the implementation is becoming a lot more difficult because of the legal frame. Uh, but we come up and then the lawyers are going to have to deal with it and hopefully they find a way around. And if we don't find a way around, sometimes we take the risk or we put them in place. It's like, I, I like your attitude about that, actually, because it reminds me of a little of Elon Musk and electric cars. He, you know, he open sourced all his patents because, well, it wasn't going to be any use if his was the only company producing electric cars. You need charging stations. And it's kind of like it's not no real use if you are the only resort with like COVID tests if no one's traveling. Like you kind of like, you know, it, the, everyone's fate is linked together here, which I think is a, a lesson for our wider industry. Um, I wanted to actually quickly go back to something we, we touched at the beginning and I, I wrote this question down but we, we've uh, we moved so fast that I wanted to go back um, to the idea that you've had a lot of you know, you've integrated a lot of companies in the last few years here um, you I think there are two kind of strains of thought in the industry on, on polar sides you've got Expedia where every brand they buy basically becomes a white label of Expedia I think orbits and hotels.com and Travelocity all look exactly the same now um, versus you know booking.com where Priceline booking Agoda all of them look different have different tech stacks and people are able to kind of really um, innovate independently and I, I'd love to understand a little bit more about where you fall in, you know, in the spectrum here is it um, force people to work together is it try to allow that entrepreneurial like you know, uh, yeah, mindset to take over independently, or are you really focused on integrating everything with each other? Well, that is that is a challenge, right? I mean, the reason why it makes sense for us to acquire these companies is because of the synergies. You assume that when you have these companies working together, they will become a lot more profitable than the sum of all of them if they were working independently, right? So you, the, what it, the challenge is to be able to capture all the synergies, to operate on the back of the house with one common platform, whether it's technology, call centers, of course, administration, human resources, all that, but at the same time, keep the brands with an individual uh, 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 value proposition. And, and just the name won't make a difference. The brands have to stand for something different. So, uh, you know, otherwise what happens, particularly in the travel industry, when you merge the brands, when you merge the, the back of the house and then you start merging with the product and the brands, the brands tend to disappear. And all of a sudden, when there was one company with a million passengers, another company with a million passenger, with another million passengers, when you merge them, you end up with a company with 1.5 million and you already lost 500,000 passengers. That had happened to TUI, to Alpitour, to many of these companies. And the reason is because if you don't have on the, uh, the independence on the, on the standalone, on the branding side and the branding proposition, you tend to just be deluded with, with everything else. And in this case, the consumer or the travel agent don't have clear, this is a different product than that. When I need this specific type of experience, I buy this brand. And when I need this additional or this other, I buy that brand. When you don't have that clarity, everything becomes blurry. And when they become blurry, you lose the strength of the brand. And that's what happened with Expedia and Fabulosity and all that. They just kept the names, but at the end of the day, now it's the same. So in our case, what we're trying to do is to, yes, merge as much as possible the back of the house to really create the synergies that make the company not only more profitable, but also way more competitive. So, you know, the, the lower the operation cost for us, the more value for money we can give to the customers. But at the same time, keep the independence and the value proposition to each of the different brands so the consumer and the travel agents has a clear perception or a, or, or, or a clear knowledge of what brand to use when. And it's a challenge because if you ask me now what's the difference in between phone jet vacations and Apple vacations, there's not much. So, so we need to see, okay, which brands should prevail and stay and which brands are clearly unique and different that they, you can justify their existence as an independent brand. Because also on the marketing side, if you know you have 20 brands, the, the, the money is never enough for marketing, you'd be deluded rather than have one big brand. But I think like what TUI has done in the past, in certain regions it worked, the world of TUI, now everything is reflected as TUI. But I have to say, Thomson still today is a stronger brand in the United Kingdom than TUI. And I think that in some cases, when they reflag some strong local brands into TUI, they lost the power and they lost the passengers and lo they lost the size. So 
we have to recognize which brands really can stand alone because they have a different value proposition. And those we have to keep them separate and, and, and then merge on the back of the house. But clearly, all of the front, the image, the look and feel, and the product itself has to be distinctively different in order to make them work. I think if you merge now all of the Porsche with all of the Volkswagen, with all of the Bentley on the, on the, or an, an Audi, with, uh, if, you, if you put the synergies to the point that you can sell all of the cars in the same dealer, you know, the, the brands, you're really going to affect the brands. You have to keep that independence. And they're clearly different products, Volkswagen than Porsche or than Bentley. But the back is the same company. You, the art is to have the right synergies for, 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 for having the, the most efficiency for the profitability in the company and the value for money for the customer. But clearly, on the brand side and on the product side, unless you make them unique and distinctive, you will never be able to justify they have different names. And then you're going to have to get rid of one of those two names. Tell me, is there anyone in the industry of a, in a leadership position that you kind of look up to and admire what they've done? You know, a fellow kind of executive in this travel, tourism and hospitality world that we live in. Yeah, well, there's many, there's many people that I, that I admire and I look after and I always observe what they, what they do, um, um, even outside of our industry, but within, within our industry, some that are very specific. And I think it, those who, who, and that's something I really believe on, you, you don't want to be or you cannot be everything for everybody. You have to be the best for some and stay focused there. And, um, and I think there's some companies that have been able to do that very successfully that I, that, that I look after. One, one of them is Harvard Crombie and Kent, for example. Yep. Jeffrey Kent and the team, uh, the way they're doing. Yes, they have expanded the product. Uh, it was just safaris in Africa and then type of excursions in other parts of the world. Then they do with private jets and yachts and things like that. But very consistent on, on the value proposition and, and, and focus on certain customers with certain values and with certain profile. And I think, um, and that's why the brand is so strong and so and so valuable. So certainly, uh, he's one of them. Uh, but but there's many others. I think uh, Ryu, for example, the Ryu family, which is Carmen and Luis Ryu, yeah. uh, which are strong shareholders of Tui also. But that's a family business that is just amazing. They do everything based on intuition. They move fast. Uh, they, 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 they're a machine that works and they don't pretend to be what they're not. Uh, uh, they're really focused on that solid, strong, four-star type of product and uh, running with high occupancy. It's almost, it's almost like a cruise ship model on land and they, <laughs> they, they execute very well. It's not that I, that's the experience that I like as a guest, but that's my personal taste. But as a business model, and the way they execute, I think they, they do it amazingly and they're very successful. So, yes, there's, there's many people in the, in the sector. I always liked the approach of the, the branding uh, on Starwood, Starwood Hotels, way more than Marriott. The Starwood, I think, I, back in the day, particularly when it was Barry Sternlich there, the approach to the brands and the innovation, uh, the uniqueness and the, dis the distinct approach to different markets, that's something I... I admire a lot and, and, and I look after, after, after that. Um, it's hard for me to look after public companies. Public companies is something that I find blurry. It's very hard to keep the passion when they're, when they're public. And now the, the, the vision changes. You start looking for the, you know, the quarter results rather than the long term. When a lot of your decisions are going to be driven by the value of the stock rather than the long term value of the company, et cetera. Yeah. So I look way more into private companies than public and uh, see how fast they move, how many decisions they make on intuition and the risk that they're willing to take uh, uh, at that level. They're more, more uh, agile. And, and, and last one from us before we uh, wrap up, Alex. I mean, if we go back uh, to the beginning of the interview and uh, you were talking about top two challenges that you'd had one was culture and 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 the, and the second one maybe maybe it's just me i was surprised that you know you, you did a very big merger a few years ago 
and that didn't you didn't mention that was is that one because it was easy or was it uh, just not as hard as the other two the last merch you mean the one with mark travel yes no that was that was way more difficult than what i expected it was more difficult than once before so when we when we acquired back in the day travel impressions and cheap caribbean two completely different companies uh, we found out that it was more difficult than what we expected particularly travel impressions precisely because of the the, the overlap in between travel impressions and apple vacations mm. i think Cheap Caribbean being 100% B2C business to the consumer and OTA was easier to keep with their personality and independence. That was easier. Travel impressions was more difficult and costly to do that. So we thought we learned what we had to learn when we acquired Mark Travel. But once we did it, it was a lot more difficult. I think the culture was number one. That was, and Mark Travel was the arch enemy of Apple vacations. So they were not on the resort side. So we just had to start differentiating which are, the, which are the unique companies that both have to understand how valuable was acquiring that piece and put it into our conglomerate. And we found that one key was technology. They had a much better technology platform than we did, and that was Tricep Solution, which is yeah. one of the companies acquired from them. And, uh, and we also thought that by having travel solutions as one big platform, it would be easier to put all of the companies into that platform, platform that was working very well and then have all these efficiencies. The issue is that technology changes so fast that by the time we were focusing and putting people in the platform, by the time we were ready, there was a new product out there. <laughs> so so that's, that, that, that was very difficult. But I would say that the most difficult challenge with the merge to mark travel was the overlap of product and the overlap of locations to really be able to capture the synergies uh, uh, without destroying the profitability and the uniqueness of each of the two. And that was a challenge. And I have to, I, I have to mention something, and it's true for us and it's true for them. I remember when we merged with Mark Travel, we were saying, we want to make the strongest team. And our philosophy, also we had some consultant as well, external consultant was, we're going to make the best of the best. In other words, we're going to keep the best of both teams and create a new team. We're not going to give preference of the Apple Vacations team to take over Mark Travel team. We're going to take the best talent on each of the teams and create a new team. And that's true and sounds great. The problem is that when you take the best of both teams, you might have the best individuals but you break teams. You break teams that are already working together. So we end up having the best individuals, like the best players, but not the best team. So when you do that, you destroy teams. And it was a big, big issue for us because we were far advanced when we realized, hey, what's happening here? We're losing a lot of valuable people. And, and, and even the very, the very valuable and talented people that we have is not performing as good because they were not performing as a team any longer. So my advice is that next time we or anybody acquires another company, you have to support the, your team and the company that's acquiring the other company and you have to take over. Even if there's great talent on the other company, your employees have to know that if you buy another company, they will be more successful they will be promoted. Because otherwise, next time you buy a company and you start the due diligence for another company, your own employees are gonna say, hold on, what if there's someone more talented than me on the new company? I'm gonna lose my job. I don't wanna be part of this. They're not excited about it because what started a great idea, let's say that Ford is gonna buy a, 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 a Chrysler. If Ford buys Chrysler, and the, and the Ford employees don't feel we are buying over, we are growing in our, in, our, in our positions, in our personal situation, we're taking over. Then if they know that when Ford buys Chrysler, Chrysler would have some individuals that are gonna replace some of the talent in Ford, you are not gonna have your team, your own team engaged and excited about this, this, this situation. That's one, but the other one is once you mix the teams, sometimes it's a result you break the teams because you're looking for synergies and you lose some very talented individuals in the middle. So I think next time we would trust our people, we would trust our teams and, and go more and absorb the new company, take the risks and, and make sure that your employees grow with you. 
the employees grow with all the executives grow with the company uh, uh, themselves. They grow, and all of a sudden they find themselves in a much more powerful or or complex or higher position than they were before, because they were part of the acquisition or the merging process. Uh, so no, the the the, the mark travel process it was it was longer than we it took longer than we expected to capture the synergies it was way more costly and uh, and we lost a lot of talented people in the, in the on the on the in the meantime you'll forgive me alex i do have one more question and i yeah i thought i thought of it during your last answer so the majority of your answers you're very passionate you know you mm-hmm. really you you talk with a lot of feeling and thought and i can imagine you as the ceo being like that with your team but you stepped down in 2019 and you're now the chairman how does your passion kind of evolve itself into being a chairman when you're not leading the team from the ceo role do you just kind of does it work in a different kind of way no well there's two things number one is for the company i still fully engage on any, I still the face of the company when it comes to have that passion for everybody. And I started by selecting a wonderful new CEO. Yeah. And that CEO, it's a professional CEO, way better than me. <laughs> he, board. he does all the things that I don't only don't know how to do, but I don't want to learn. If he has, he has a PO, IPO experience. If we decide to take the company public one day, he's done that in the past successfully. He knows how to do it. I don't want to learn how to do it that I would never like to be a CEO of a public company. So, uh, so, so, so he's, he's a great, he's a professional. He's very institutional. Uh, he's very smart. He's also very likable. So, uh, and he's been, he has positioned himself as a leader very, in a very short period of time. I'm very impressed with him. I have a great personal relationship with him. But I think what we, where I can help him and help the company a lot is to don't stop Number one, investing. I keep investing. I'm a shareholder, but I keep investing money. I'm adding more money to the company. But also, I have my role as a chairman, continue to be pushing for this passion, pushing for new ideas, pushing for new acquisitions and, and, and growth and new management contracts, etc. to the point that people will still recognize me as Alex is still here. He's still pushing. He's vetted. He's engaged. He has his money on. But he wants now to move on and do different things in life. But in the meantime, he's still here. He's still one of us. And I want to make sure that they know that I'm still part of them. And some of them, I owe them everything. They did a wonderful job for me for many years. They moved to different countries with the whole families. And they've done very well. Luckily, they do very well. But they're very loyal, very good people. And they're my personal friends. So I'll take care of them. So, and that will continue, regardless of my title. But on the other hand, I think, I think life is cycles, just like I was very successful in my previous hotel company where I was VP of sales and marketing. I had a wonderful life and I was there for 13 years, but I decided to start a new cycle. I moved to the United States and I started this company. Now for me in my life, it's a new cycle to dedicate more time to some things that are not for profit, that I need to dedicate more time, that really pull me, I have passion. And I'm fully dedicated now to some of these organizations that I support. We have an orphanage in Honduras. We have, I'm part of the Rafa Nadal Foundation uh, in America uh, to helping the kids to, to be reintroduced to societies. Um, I'm part of the conservation uh, foundation here in the area that I live. I live in the farms that I, 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 I help them. I have a foundation called Saving Our Sharks. I'm deeply involved with uh, Saving Sharks. I'm a scuba diver and I love sharks. And, and those are the nonprofit uh, causes that I fully support, that I love, and that I haven't got the time to, 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 to dedicate. I've been able to, I've been supporting them with money for a long time, but now I want to dedicate it with time and talent and they really pull me. So I want to split down my time, dedicate a lot more to the nonprofit causes, including the WTTC, the World Travel and Tourism Council, and, uh, and less time to the company, which is now in great hands on the day to day, which is the new CEO, which is wonderful. And that's a great moment for us to end, actually. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Alex Azoya, for, uh, for joining us on How I Got Here this week. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks so, thanks so much, David.
Okay, so uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. This is another episode of How I Got Here. That's Mozio and Focuswise weekly podcast where we talk to the innovators and entrepreneurs in travel, tourism and hospitality. Our thanks again uh, to Alex from uh, Apple Ledger Group. If you are not a subscriber to How I Got Here, you can do so by going to the usual platforms, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, no relation to Apple Ledger Group, of course, and uh, Google Podcasts. So uh, maybe not yet, but anyway. <laughs> so uh, thanks again. Uh, make sure you subscribe and thank you as always for tuning in thanks again to Alex and David and I and we'll see you next time thanks for listening to How I Got Here podcast we'll be back next week with more inside stories behind startups and innovation in travel and transportation check mozio.com slash move for a complete write up of the highlights of every podcast with translations into five languages and get your daily dose of news on the digital travel economy by subscribing to the newsletter at focuswire.com. See you next week.